This is the PlayStation Portal, a new handheld remote player for the PlayStation 5. But why did Sony make this? That's the question that I've been asking since they first announced it. This thing can't play any games natively, it only works via remote play. It streams the games from your PS5 so you can relax in bed or play in another room or away from home over the internet. It's essentially an add-on, a peripheral for the PS5 that you already own. It's not a separate platform like the PSP or the Vita that had their own set of games. And yet, despite all of that, after actually trying this out and using it, I think this thing is really cool. The portal is by far the best way to remote play but it's not without some quirks. What's up guys, my name is Jack. I make videos about all things tech, and there's a few things that I wanna cover in this review. Firstly, how does this thing even work? How well does it play if it's streaming a game from your PS5? And also answer the peripheral versus platform question. Why did Sony choose to make this a peripheral for the PS5 instead of a whole new separate platform with native games like a PSP? And to answer that question, we need to take a bit of a look back. This is the PlayStation Vita, the last handheld that Sony made and released all the way back in 2011. It was towards the end of the PS3 life cycle, just before the PS4 came out for some context. Amazingly, it still works. I haven't used it in years. I thought the battery might have died, but no, nope, it's still going strong. This could play some classic PlayStation games from the PS1 and 2 era. Things like Crash Bandicoot and Spyro, no trouble at all. But there was just no way that Sony could squeeze all of the power from the PS3 into something so small and portable. So this was never going to be able to, you know, run PS3 games. Instead, Sony treated it as its own platform with its own Vita games that developers had to make and support. And some did. It had its very own Little Big Planet game, which was pretty cool. Even an Uncharted prequel game, which you know, a lot of people probably never even knew about. But that, of course, is a lot of work to make an entirely separate game. It takes time. Games have to start development before the Vita went on sale, which is always a big risk because if the Vita doesn't sell well, well, you've just put a lot of money and resources into making a game that isn't even going to break even, let alone make a profit. Ultimately, the Vita was considered a bit of an industry flop for a few reasons, but mainly because it was difficult to make games for, so many developers just didn't bother. And if there's no games worth playing, then people aren't going to invest in getting the hand held. It's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Fast forward to now, and Sony clearly doesn't want another repeat of the Vita, and there's still no way to squeeze all of the power from a PS5 into something that is small and handheld. They could make something less powerful and you know, run the same games at a lower fidelity with less graphics quality. But again, you're still asking developers to put time and effort into downscaling their games when we're well into the PS5 life cycle. And a lot of developers aren't even making crushed in games anymore. They're focused entirely on the PS5 and maximizing its potential. Which brings us to the PlayStation Portal. Instead of risking making an entirely new platform that may or may not be a success, why not make a peripheral that takes advantage of the PS5, that uses it to run the games, and then stream the game to the handheld using remote play? That way there's parity between the two systems and you get way better handheld graphics using the PS5's power. And you're not having to develop for and support two separate platforms. If a platform fails, and that can be a pretty big hit to a company, but if a peripheral fails, it's not going to have so much of a negative impact. Which I think is why we ended up with the Portal and not a new PSP. So let's take a bit of a close look at this thing, because not going to lie, it does look a bit weird. It's literally like Sony took a DualSense controller, split it in half, and then slapped an 8-inch display right in the middle. It feels very familiar if you've used a DualSense before, albeit, you know, a lot wider. It weighs just over half a kilogram, or just over a pound, which doesn't feel too heavy or you know tiring to hold which you don't want with something like this it's got all the same triggers and buttons where you'd expect them the d-pad the face buttons the full-size analog sticks they did have to move a couple of things around to keep them easy to reach like the playstation button is in the top left and the mute button at the top right and in place of the touchpad we've got this eight inch touch screen the whole screen is touch sensitive but it uses these two areas close to where your thumbs sit for any swipe or tap gestures that you might need in some games. You can also swipe in from the top right corner to access the Portal OS, I guess it's called, but it is very basic. There's a brightness slider for the screen, an option to turn off the mute button light or the light bar that runs down either side. I actually think this looks pretty slick, so I've left it on. There's some system settings for software updates and power saving options, and that's about it. Up top, there's a power button, a new PlayStation Link button, more on that in a minute, 
and some volume controls. We've also got the same adaptive triggers as the DualSense. And I love these, they're so cool. These have the ability to change their resistance in real time. For instance, when you're playing something like Horizon where you're using a bow, the trigger will provide some resistance giving you a realistic feeling of pulling back on a bowstring. That really enhanced the gameplay by adding some physical feedback that corresponds to what's happening in game. So I'm glad to see that Sony carried these over to the portal. The same goes for the haptics. This gives you really precise vibration feedback. You get a whole bunch of cool sensations like feeling different surfaces or textures or the impacts of certain actions. One of the best demos of this is still Astro's Playroom, which comes free with the PS5. I highly recommend that you check it out if you're getting the console. You can feel the difference when walking over different materials, like metal feels different to glass, which feels different to sand, and so on. It just adds a whole nother level of immersion without being distracting. Then underneath we have a USB-C port for charging and a 3.5mm headphone jack. If you want to use some Bluetooth headphones, well you can't because the portal doesn't have Bluetooth. Neither does the PS5 for that matter, so it shouldn't be that much of a surprise. But instead this has something called PlayStation Link. This is a new wireless audio connectivity standard that PlayStation has created for their upcoming Pulse Explore earbuds and the Pulse Elite headset. Link is designed to be ultra low latency to help reduce audio lag and it supports lossless audio for even higher fidelity sound quality. But only these upcoming headsets support Link and they don't come out until December for the earbuds and February for the headset. And I have got them on pre-order, so if you want to see some videos on those, hit like and subscribe. But until then, you are stuck using wired headphones or using the built-in speakers, which, you know, do the job, they're fine, but they're nothing groundbreaking. The display measures 8 inches across diagonally. It is only a 1080p display, which is the current maximum resolution supported by Remote Play anyway, so no 4K. No OLED either, it is just a standard LED display, which means no high dynamic range. Which feels a little bit like it was deliberately left out so they could sell an OLED model down the line, but we'll see. Nonetheless, picture quality is great, and so are the graphics, as the PS5 is doing all the heavy lifting here. Remote play works up to 60 FPS, but the resolution and frame rate is going to depend on your home network connection, or your Wi-Fi speed if you're using the portal away from home. But how does the whole remote play thing even work? Well, once you've enabled it for the first time on your PS5 and logged into your PlayStation account on the portal, it starts searching for the PS5 to connect to. At home, the PS5 and portal are most likely going to be connected to the same router, so the whole process happens locally. It takes about a minute for the connection to happen, and then you get this really cool Doctor Strange portal animation as you portal through to the PlayStation. And then you can just remotely control your PS5 as it streams a live video feed of the console to the handheld. And the whole process feels pretty seamless. It works really well. There is inevitably going to be some lag, some latency. I don't have a particularly fancy network setup at home. I am just using the Wi-Fi router that the internet provider gave me, but it feels pretty solid. I don't feel like I'm missing any hits or beats when playing. And now, you know, you're free to go and play in another room or let someone else use the TV. For me, I quite like using it for more casual games when I just want to explore a game world or find some collectibles. It's quite funny, I've seen a few people call this the dad station because, well, I guess it's a good way to pick up and play when you're super busy. Maybe you've got kids and you don't have time to sit down for longer gaming sessions or maybe they want to use the TV. You might get a big stutter occasionally or see the video quality drop. It kind of looks like you're watching a 360p video on YouTube, but in my experience, for the majority of the time, the connection's been really reliable. And just to mention, Remote Play isn't new. The Vita could Remote Play from both the PS3 and the PS4, so this is something that Sony have been working on and perfecting for quite some time. If you're into, you know, really fast-paced first-person shooters playing online where every millisecond counts, then you might find the lag to be just a little bit too much. It really depends on your home network. Not so much your internet speed, as it is all happening locally through the router. Unless you're playing away from home, and then Sony says you'll need at least a 5 megabit connection as a minimum. But 50 megabits is recommended for a better experience at 1080p 60fps. I did try this out at my sister's house, and you know it worked. It took a little bit longer to make that initial connection. And there was a little bit more latency with that video feed now getting streamed over the internet to the portal. But honestly, it was not like a huge difference. It was still very much playable, so you've got the option to play away from home as well. But there is a problem. Let's say that you wanted to take this on a trip and play while you're away from your hotel room, or even just at a coffee shop, or anywhere where you need to join a public network. 
Well, the portal doesn't have any sort of web browser, which means there's no way to log into or accept the terms and conditions before you can get on the public Wi-Fi network, which is a bit of an oversight, but one that could be fixed with a software update. I can't see Sony adding a full-blown user accessible web browser to this, as it's usually through the web browser that people try and find hacks and exploits to jailbreak the OS. But they could at least add in something basic that pops up when you need to log in or accept some T's and C's before connecting to public Wi-Fi. In terms of battery life, you'll get around seven to eight hours on a single charge, which is pretty decent. And you don't have to worry about more intensive games using more power like on other handhelds as that's all handled by the PS5. Now this isn't the only option if you are looking to play the PS5 remotely, so I thought I'd run through some alternatives. Firstly, you can just use the Remote Play app on your phone or tablet, which overlays some digital buttons on screen. Honestly though, wouldn't recommend this as I think you'll have a bit of a bad time with the touch controls, but you can pair your DualSense with whatever device you're using, even a computer, and play that way, which is a far better experience, and you even get all of the haptics and the adaptive trigger features through the controller. But still a bit awkward to move around, and you are gonna need a table and a stand to prop up your device. For phones, Sony partnered with Backbone to make a special PlayStation edition of the Backbone controller. I recently did a video all about it. If you wanna check it out, I will link to it below. Your phone sits in the middle. They have Lightning and USB-C versions. It has all of the main buttons and triggers that you'd expect, but shrunk down and smaller with no haptics and no adaptive triggers. Probably because the whole thing is pretty slimline to keep it nice and portable. But still a great option, and it works as a controller for any of your native iPhone or Android games that have controller support. So in some ways, it is more of a PSP than the Portal. But for me, the Portal wins it out as the best way to remote play. It's the best overall form factor and easy to move around the house with or play in another room or lie down with. It feels very familiar, very comfortable to hold. I love the controller and all of the haptics and the adaptive triggers, which can really add a lot to the gameplay experience. It's just a great pick up and play device for some more casual gaming if you don't always have time to sit down and play, or if you're someone who has to fight for control of the TV. That said, it has some quirks. There's no Bluetooth support for the wireless headphones that you currently own, and no way to connect to certain public networks, at least until Sony adds support for those panels that pop up that let you log into Wi-Fi at places like hotels. And as of right now, you can only remote play from a PS5. Sony has this whole catalogue of games that you can stream from the cloud to your PS5, but no way to stream directly to the portal, which would open this up to way more people and just make it even more of a standalone device. Like, I can't help but feel like some parents are going to accidentally buy this for their kids for Christmas without knowing that you actually need a PS5 for it to work. But let me know what you think in the comments. I can totally understand and see why Sony made this instead of a new PSP platform and all the risks that come with doing that. Is it worth the £200, $200 asking price? It does feel a little bit on the high end considering the lack of actual hardware here with the PS5 doing the heavy lifting. But that said, the build quality is fantastic and this is the best way that I have found to remote play. Leave a like if you enjoyed the video, that really helps the channel out. And if you want to see more tech videos from me, you can hit subscribe and the bell. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.